This is the second in the videos that I'm recording of those lectures. I decided to break them up by pathogen. So the second one is the influenza A virus. And influenza A virus is one of the most serious pathogens of humans. There is always the poten potential that this virus can mutate and then begin a worldwide pandemic. The influenza A virus is an envelope virus, as you can see here. It, it, the envelope comes from the host membrane of cells it buds out of. It will have two major proteins on its surface. One of them is the hemagglutinin, HA. The other one is the neuraminidase, NA. These two in, in, can indicate by serological identification the type of virus, and that's what's used in identification. You've probably heard terms like H1N1, H3N2, H3N1, and they're indicating what serological type of hemagglutinin and what serological type of neuraminidase is present on the virus. Inside the envelope, there will be a protein capsid composed of matrix protein, and that will also have an M, uh, ion channel, M2. Inside of there are the segmented negative stranded RNA genome, and each one of these will have a polymerase on it. Uh, so this RNA polymerase is made of PB1, PB2, and PA, and it also has a five prime cap, and you'll find out how they get that as we talk about the virus. Here again are the different proteins, and you'll see that each one the negative strand is copied into a positive strand. It has a cap and a poly A tail added onto it, and then they all get translated. PB1, PA, and PB2 make the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And the HA negative strand makes the hemagglutinin. The NP makes the nucleocapsid protein that coats the viral RNA. NA is the neuraminidase. There's a matrix protein, an M2 ion channel. So the influenza virus enters what during acidification of the endosome. So it binds to its receptor, which is sialic acid, which is actually a receptor that's found on many different organisms, including birds and mammals. So you'll find it in humans, you'll find it in pigs, you find it in a number of different bird species. And that will become important later. So it binds the sialic acid receptor, it then is taken into an endosome by the usual endocytotic pathway, but when the pH begins to drop and before a lysosome interacts with an endosome, this drop in pH will cause it to bind to the membrane and then uncoat and dump the RNA, single-stranded RNAs into the cytoplasm. Now, very unusual for an RNA virus, these RNAs then have a signal that causes them to be imported into the nucleus. Once in the nucleus, the viral replicase starts copying the negative strand to a positive strand, and then it does something very interesting. It steals caps from host mRNA that's being formed. So it steals the cap and snatches it and puts it on there, and it makes a messenger RNA this way. Once the mRNAs come outside, they're all translated, and depending upon the protein signals on them, they are transported to different parts of the cell. The hemagglutinin and neuraminidase and M2 are transported through the Golgi apparatus onto the surface of the, of the host cell and then migrate to an area where the virus is going to bud from. The M1 and NS2 are, are translated they come in and they end up coating the inside of the progenitor virus. The PA, PB2, and PB1 all move in and they associate with various RNAs. They then are transported out of the cell and then they'll associate with a, a nuclear protein and then they are then joined the budding virus. This then all assembles and then buds outside the cell. Okay, so the disease. Uh, influenza can be transmitted by airborne droplets and direct contact. 
And when it enters, it establishes the local upper respiratory tract infection. During this infection, it will damage the cilia of the epithelium of the upper respiratory tract. And in serious cases, it may spread to the lower respiratory tract. You get classic flu-like symptoms, which are fever, malaise, headaches, and body aches. And that is probably the, the distinctive traits of influenza is a, a, high, a significantly higher fever than you get in other things, and then chills and headaches and body aches. The systemic symptoms are caused by interferon and cytokine response to the infection. Major complications include secondary bacterial infections, especially Staphylococcus pneumoniae, and this can be what can kill older patients. Antibodies that are generated against the virus are protective to the specific antigenic type, such as H1N1, but not other antigenic types, and that is why you can keep getting reinfected with flu over time. Now, people generally use the term flu to talk about a number of different illnesses, like the stomach flu, the you know gastrointestinal flu, or whatever, but classic flu involves a high fever, malaise, and chills and body aches. There are treatments for influenza. They work best if given shortly after infection, and they don't normally prevent the immunopathology, which means is that your body still raises an immune response. Amantadine and rimantadine inhibit uncoating, but resistance to these are increasing. Zenanafir and ostelomirafir inhibit the neuraminidase. Okay. Oseltamivir is also known as Tamiflu and was given, uh, lots of people were trying to hoard it during the last influenza epidemic. An annual vaccine is a mixture of HA and NA from several different strains, and it is your best method of prevention of this illness. It's prepared in eggs and then chemically inactivated. Uh, the, this is an injected form. There are now procedures using mammalian cells to grow up influenza. This batch culture technique is becoming better and better to the point that it will probably at some point replace use of eggs in developing a flu vaccine. There are newer live vaccines also available. One of them is a nasal spray. Okay, now two important topics I want to talk about are antigenic drift and antigenic shift. Being an RNA virus, it has an RNA replicase that does not have an editing function. And this is similar to cold viruses. So therefore, these, this RNA virus mutates very rapidly and you will get a change. And in antigenic drift, you have single base pair changes in one of the RNAs. And in this case, it's changing, let's say, the neuraminidase. And you'll have this small change, but now the immune system won't recognize it. And an individual that was previously immune to the flu on the left here is no longer, the immune system doesn't fight this as effectively and they can still get sick. However, because they've been exposed to a similar strain, the disease isn't as severe. Okay, so those can, are caused, can cause epidemic strains, and those are the ones that will circulate throughout a population. However, uh, sometimes, again, remember that influenza virus can infect birds. It can infect other mammals, such as pigs. You will get an influenza virus mixing inside, let's say, a pig that has and an avian virus mixing inside a pig and a human virus mixing inside a pig and then you will get a whole segment replacement and making a completely brand new virus. This virus here down on the right, this has completely new neuraminidase that when we are exposed to this, it, we are completely naive. Our immune system is completely naive to this virus and cause a serious infection. And this is where pandemic strains come from. The pandemic strain in 2009 that initially began from this type of mixing. And that strain in its initial infections had a 50% mortality rate. Now, luckily for us, as it went through humans, it attenuated and it, it became a pandemic strain, but a much less serious one. We dodged the bullet in that case.
that is antigenic shift. When you have mixing of viruses from several different species inside, let's say, a pig, and then that then causing a pandemic, that is from antigenic shift. Antigenic drift is just a single mutation that changes a virus that's circulating in the population so it can reinfect again, and normally those don't cause as serious of an illness. Okay, group discussion. A major avian influenza strain has been discovered that can be transmitted occasionally to humans if a chicken bites a human. How could you interrupt this transmission cycle? And imagine that you have big markets where hundreds of thousands of chickens are being sold. What could you do to interrupt this transmission cycle? Okay, I'll pause it now, think about it, and then I'll tell you a couple of the answers. All right, some of the things that were said in class. Number one, you could vaccinate all the chickens. Right? So then if you vaccinate all the chickens, that would cure the illness. Number two, you could quarantine the ill chickens. Number three, you could close down the market and just wait for the influenza to pass and then reopen it up. And that's kind of a type of quarantine. Or number four, you could kill all the chickens. There have been several times where influenza has spread through open markets like this in different areas of the world. One of them, for instance, is Hong Kong. And in those instances, what they did is they killed all the chickens. That is how serious public health departments take influenzas and potential pandemic influenza strains. 